Okay, the floor is all yours, Dr. Thomas. Here I was talking and muted. So if you're not talking, go ahead and mute yourself. So now you can mute yourself, uh, Reverend Jenkins. Okay. Well, one of the things I want you to think about is, you know a joy. We all know a joy. Joy is cost conscious and anxious. She's a professional cosmetologist. Come on, Katrina, you can turn your camera on. And she says, I love my job. I love my clients. I just want to feel safe and healthy so I can open up my shop again and continue to serve the community. In many ways, uh, Katrina, you've helped us come up with the composite of joy. Now she lives in Capitol Heights, Maryland. She's written up in beauty magazines as the queen of hair. Joy received awards for her makeup and artistry and skin expertise. She was not surprised to learn she's a pre-diabetic due to her family history. And after studying nutrition, Joy discovered how to adjust her lifestyle and found her passion for helping the community achieve better health through food, aromatherapy, and skin care in her Hyattsville salon. Joy is very ambitious and continues to learn and add value to her clients. She is adamant about getting vaccinated so she can open up her salon and serve the community again. You therefore see her goals. Um, uh, Katrina, if you can see the screen, nod your head. Okay, uh, uh, Katrina, read read uh, Joy's uh, goals. Can you do oh, that? Wait. wait a minute, I need to get my glasses. Let's see, let me see if I can read it without getting my glasses. <laughs> yeah, this we, screen is moving all over the place. She's zooming to be in. Able yeah, I can read it. Let me read it. Okay. Joy's goals is to be able to work in a safe environment, to develop her own line of health and beauty products, to adjust her lifestyle to fight the onsets of diabetes, to get fully vaccinated so that she can safely reopen her shop and serve her customers again. Okay. All right. Now, Priscilla, can you help me? Can you unmute yourself, Priscilla? and uh, move over and Priscilla is going to read the frustrations. Frustrations, worries that she's a bit overweight and pre-diabetic. Members of her family have had amputations due to diabetes. The pandemic has caused her close up, has caused her close, the pandemic has caused her her shop. Something missing there. <laughs> shop. Okay. I yeah. Probably. Lives outside the beltway and delays medical care due to cost and lack of transportation to health care facilities. Okay. Let's let's back out a little bit so we can see uh, joy. And so this is our persona. We all know a joy. We're going to try to get in joy, get under joy's skin and think like joy and, and try to experience what joy is experiencing. You see her goals, you see her frustrations. Now we're going to go on a journey with joy. Tim? Great. Um, so Michelle, are we going to go down to talk about joy's journey through uh, vaccination? Yes, we are. Um, I can take it from here if you like, actually. Take it away. So phase one is contemplation. So Joy might have first heard that the COVID-19 vaccine was available in Prince George's County from either these traditional touch points or these non-traditional touch points, such as the local paper distributed at metro stations, community health centers, or perhaps she heard it on Radio One, Grace and Glory, or some official Twitter accounts, for example, from Angela Also Brooks. And maybe Joy investigated further to resolve some of her questions by checking out the Prince George's County Health Department website, or maybe she looked up some YouTube videos, she scrolled through some Facebook groups or the Nextdoor app. The next stage is phase two, preparation. Now all these stages I will add are based on the cycle of change. And so here, Joy started to form an opinion and she spoke to people that she trusts at the Maryland Center for Health Equity, or maybe she called into some hotlines and helplines. Or maybe she also dropped into the Zoom town halls, or maybe she visited Mike at the barbershop, 
or maybe she saw someone like Joy at the beauty shop. And she finally made a decision and started to prepare for her vaccination by visiting Public Health Awakened, the PGC Health Department website, or the Community Ministry of PGC. And now finally, in the last phase of this journey, she decides to act. And so Joy booked an appointment and she planned how she would travel to Holy Cross Hospital, the University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center, or decided that next time she'd actually get the vaccination at one of the mobile health clinics that she saw, Reed Temple or the First Baptist Church. And now here I wanna zoom out and out of this whole journey, I want to quickly ask, and you can shout it out if you like, are there any touch points in this journey that you think are missing? Are there any touch points that you think that Joy was able to contemplate, prepare or act on her decision in a different touch point that is not already listed here? Uh, I um, <clears throat> think I, I heard of someone getting uh, a vaccination at Walmart. So the mm. retail stores are also um, a place where a lot of people are going. Walmart, uh, CVS, uh, Walgreens. And so I think that's uh, the convenience um, uh, is very much uh, in the community now. That's great. Okay, so we have Walmart, CVS, and Walgreens in phase three. Are there any other touch points that we may have missed? So go back to contemplation. Mm -hmm. Now, scholars, contemplation, that's what you know, you know those people that are sitting around thinking about it. Priscilla, you haven't met people just thinking about it, hadn't done a thing, hadn't planned a thing, hadn't gone anywhere. They're just, some people might call it procrastination, but maybe they're just waiting for something. What? Might be fear. Okay. Fear. Mm -hmm. In contemplation mode. Michelle, I'm gonna let you add the stickies. Keep going, uh, Priscilla, get under uh, Joy's skin. What is, she's contemplating, she's thinking, she's sometimes can't sleep well because she's thinking about that. What else is going on with her? Doubt, <laughs> trust. <laughs> okay. Mm. And the procrastination. <laughs> You know, kind of like a wait and see. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's true. A lot of people say, I'm going to wait and see. Mm hmm. I did. <laughs> okay, so I've added procrastination. Maybe she's waiting and seeing. And so we're starting to get a little bit into some of the roadblocks. So let's just scroll downwards, or I will scroll downwards. Um, and we're going to get into our first activity. So our first activity is identifying roadblocks or barriers, uh, things that are not helpful to Joy when she's trying to either contemplate, prepare for, or act on this decision to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And so first, um, I will review the uh, roadblocks that are here. And of course, Dr. Thomas can add in any context as he pleases. And I'll ask if any are missing. And so in addition to the roadblocks that you've already mentioned, uh, Priscilla and Reverend Jenkins, uh, there might be some historical inequities, there might be a lack of access to good information, um, and there's plenty of empty sticky notes for us to add to. So let me zoom in and read them out to you. So number one is persistence of racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, uh, lack of investment in health infrastructure, lack of attention to underlying conditions uh, that make people of color more vulnerable to the consequences of COVID-19 infection. And if we scroll over to the side here, we have a lack of access to vaccine information that has been culturally tailored. There's a false narrative of vaccine hesitancy, information about the vaccine that is rapidly changing and that can make it very confusing. Maybe there's a lack of access to technology and or internet. And there's an active effort to misinform communities on network channels and on social media. And so these are some of the things that you might think or that people like Joy uh, might encounter when she's trying to just learn and contemplate about getting the COVID vaccine. 
And so here I'm going to open up some time and ask you if there are any additional roadblocks that are missing here. All right, scholars. You are getting into Joy's head. What's missing here? Just unmike yourselves and just call it out and we'll add it to the board. Reverend, what's missing? I well, <clears throat> I think what is happening, you know, the discussion among peers mm. and uh people, family members mm -hmm. and the doubters okay. uh, can influence it. Um, I've run into several of the people that I've talked to that will not take it because they have found, and maybe it's under information about the vaccine is rapidly changing, but what they are, they are bringing up now that it's so many people that have been vaccinated and still have contracted COVID that uh, they feel like it's nothing I mean, why bother if you're going to get it anyway? Even though I say to them, well, you're not dead, you know, you won't die or it won't be as badly. But they feel like, why bother? People are dying from it. So I think, you know, and a lot of the people that I'm talking about, they're not ignorant. It's my grandson who is a recent college graduate and more intellectually. Uh, astute, mm. he thinks, you know, and is uh, thinks it's a conspiracy. I want to say, I want to add the conspiracy theory mm. that they feel like it's a conspiracy, especially now that you're talking about boosters, yeah, and talking about more vaccine and all of that, and it's making you leery, even making me leery. I I had not planned to be taking anything else. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll tell the truth. That's all of that. Hi, Beth. Welcome, Beth Zeidman. You're muted. Hi, I am so sorry. I've been trying to get on for about 40 minutes now. No, no, we should be sorry if you've had technical problems, but we're just so glad to see you here. Yes, okay, thanks, sorry. Okay. You'll, you'll, you'll get right into the flow. So we're okay, talking, thank you. Uh, talking about one of our personas. Priscilla, get into Joy's head. What else is happening? And she's in the phone. Um, you know, uh, Mr. T, um, I, I'm, I'm coming from, it's more from a personal experience and the fact that I just took my first shot two weeks ago and everything that I experienced with the insecurities and the fear and the not understanding and the misinformation that was out there. Um, and they talked about the conditions that it affected. There was just one would say one thing and then another would say something else. And there was so much confusion, just so much confusion. And, and for me, I just keep going back to the same thing, the confusion, the fear, and trust. And uh, each section, I just see confusion, fear, and trust all over. It's, I can't move away from that because that was uh, my roadblock. My experience was the confusion, fear, and trust. Well, you are not alone. And, 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 and that's exactly what we want you to draw out because you're resonating with joy. Now, Mike can get under, uh, Mike's got sisters, aunts, wives, friends. Mm -hmm. So you know a joy, Mike, you got a joy in your life. No question. Uh, today I had a, a customer in my chair and uh, the Washington Post was here uh, on an interview. And this was the guy that they've been looking for because he had every reason why he did wouldn't, will not take it. And all of it stemmed to what he was saying was the distrust. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you can look back at history, the powers that be have not been kind to our people. And uh, small incidents, well, it, it wasn't small because it was a great, it was a great thing done to those people in Tuskegee. They still talk about. Um, however, I, I believe that uh, it's a new 
it's a new day. It's a new era. All those systemic racism is still going on. I believe it's on it's on the change, and we have to take a position that change is going to work, and the right people are in position to make sure that the change works. I don't I don't I don't suspect that it's going to happen overnight, but I think. Uh, on all playing fields in the court system, in the healthcare system, in the uh, in the home environment, that uh, the black community will get a break, a, a fair shake finally, and then maybe the trust can re regain itself, and maybe the uh, the black community will trust the government no more. But uh, the fight from our point right now is to fight the conspiracy theories. But when you have people who are saying no with no validity behind why they're saying no. I mean, what do you do? Uh, march around the, the walls of Jericho 11 times, hope they fall, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of frustrating from, from my point of view when you run into people like that, but uh, that's what I like to say. You always have to stay humble and fit the shape of the container so you can try to address them at their level. But sometimes that doesn't even work. So, you know, it's, what do you do? Then uh, they're gonna start passing the law. You don't have to wear your mask if you're vaccinate, vaccinated. You don't know who's vaccinated or who's not. So it's not fair to me who's fully vaccinated that a person who hasn't been vaccinated took a position not to be vaccinated and now they can take their mask off around me. I don't think that's fair at all. Back to, um, the, back to the confusion, Priscilla. Back you to know? the confusion. <laughs> so I'm curious for the group, I think we've had some good themes about um, you know, to Mike's recent point, um, historical distrust, sort of insecurities and fear and a lot of different information, um, you know, in, amongst families and peer groups, people who are doubters and that being persuasive. You know, we also know from the research that Dr. Thomas's group has done, um, you know, we've heard lack of uh, information, lack of access to care. I'm curious for the group, what would you say the biggest barrier is um, for folks like Joy, like when you look at this list of things, what's what's the biggest thing that's getting in her way as she sort of seeks information about um, a vaccine? Yeah, if you if you wanted Tim to put a star by the big ones, where should he put that star? Could you repeat the question again, please? Yeah, totally. So what of these options here and, and what we've talked about, what are the biggest sort of barriers you think are the biggest things that would get in Joy's way as she's thinking about, you know, if you think about that, that persona and she's thinking about, should I get the vaccine or not? And just sort of thinking about it, which of these are the, like the most important thing to be aware of that, that may um, get in her way of making a choice? I think it would be lack of attention to her underlying conditions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, now Katrina, uh, elaborate a little bit. What do you mean by that? Because I think if, if she had lack of attention in these other areas and the other ailments that she already had, why would she trust the vaccination? There we go. <clears throat> Are you trying to say if, if they didn't care about her diabetes, why yes. she, think they're going to care about her vaccine? Yes. Why would she trust, trust the vaccination if she already had that lack of attention with the other conditions that she faced? Yeah. It's a great insight. Yes. Um, how about for other folks, when you sort of look at this list, what, what would you say is the biggest barrier? I, I say information about the vaccine is rapidly changing. One day it's it's okay, then two days later it's not. You go five steps forward, ten steps backward, two steps forward, the shift to the left and dip dip twice. You don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But literally, that's how it feels like from one day to the next, and. You just, you don't know what to do. And if you don't know the electric slide, you're messing up. <laughs> and that one person, that one person, if you're watching, that one person throws off anybody that's circled around them would throw them off as well. And that's how all this keeps going. 
Okay, just, good analogy. Let me tell my hungry, yeah, exactly. let me tell my Canadian friends. Yeah. <laughs> I like the uh, <laughs> the false narrative of the vaccine hesitancy blaming the community. Okay. <laughs> say more about that, Mike. Uh, I'm going to say you know the false narrative that uh, they shouldn't take the vaccine and blame the community. I, I believe the community needs to be held responsible, especially. God forbid a second outbreak comes. You got to shut everything down and we lose all the ground that we gained from the past year because people are taking the position not to take the vaccine because of some fact, I mean, some fiction that they're standing on. It has no validity. And the world is, is taking it. It's not like an isolated incident like Tuskegee. The world is taking it. Uh, I think the community should take some form of responsibility if this thing was to flare back, if the worst possible scenario could happen. It would be their fault the people who aren't getting vaccinated to me, in my opinion. And they need to be held accountable. Great. Um, this is awesome. So I know we have more steps to get through. So I'm going to move us along to the next step. Um, so we kind of designed this knowing that we would need to move quickly. It, it'll work out in the end, trust me. Um, it was really helpful to get a sense of barriers there. So in the next step, um, we're talking about preparation. And so if we think about Joy, um, as she's sort of preparing, some of the roadblocks we heard from research from Dr. Thomas's group was, you know, for her, the cost of childcare could really affect her decision to get vaccinated. Um, insurance is expensive or difficult to qualify for, so she could think, I need to be insured for this to happen for me. It's too expensive. Um, committed to homeschooling. So we all know right now, if we've got kids, really hard to get out of the house at times or childcare is, you know, different with school right now. Um, a number of things are in lack of trust. So, you know, there's not enough vaccine for my community, for the black community. Um, last lack of trust in community health systems, lack of trust in government entities, and then lack of treating, uh, to underlying health conditions. So I'm curious, you know, you imagine Joy in this moment of starting to prepare for a vaccination. These are some of the roadblocks we heard from um, the research. What, what's missing? What would you add into here for, for folks like Joy? Okay, Beth, you can jump in here. You can't break anything. <laughs> I'm wondering. Um, so now she's planning. She's preparing, right, Tim? She's in the preparation mode. She's in preparation mode. And she's trying to figure out how to get her vaccine back. But all those things you just heard. But what have we missed that she might be experiencing? Well, well certainly, I think everyone is just so overwhelmed and everyone wants to do the right thing. Um, but you, it's like all, you have all these force vectors coming in at you. Like, you know, how do I get there? Um, am I going to be sick after I get the shot? And then how will I take care of my family? Um, concerns about, is this really going to work or help? Um, yeah, great. And so it sounds like Beth, almost a lot of that stuff is like informational of like, there's so much information. It's an right. overwhelming time to begin with. I have a number of very practical questions of like, I've got a three-year-old girl at home. Am I going to be too sick to take care of her? Or do I need a day off work? Like that sort of level of planning. Right. Great. So I guess it is information so that I can be prepared. But then again, sometimes it's hard to weed through all the information, you know, because it contradicts itself or it's not necessarily plain speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So she's preparing um, to get the vaccine, but there are multiple vaccines out there. And she's not sure if she wants to get just anything that's offered to her. So that's going to hold her up 
because she's got concerns about all she's hearing around Johnson and Johnson. I'm just gonna put it out there, that's true. We saw it in real time. People closed the door, people hung up the phone. It was very interesting. And so anyone who's got firsthand feedback, family, friends, people you've encountered when it comes to J&J, &J, because that could be generalized to any of the other vaccines if, if, if they ever experience what J&J &J went through, that would make it something people wouldn't take or would be hesitant to take, even if it was available. Floor is open. No, well, interesting. no question. Um, interesting. Oh, so let's do that. Go ahead, Mike, and then and then Beth. Mike, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, I have firsthand experience from when we did the clinic the other day. I had a few people who had signed up to, to come and be vaccinated. However, when uh, they called me and asked, asked me to ask the healthcare professionals what were they giving, and I told them the J and J, it was like was talking to the dial tone. It was like, no thank you. <laughs> uh, they hung up. Uh, uh, a few people came. We had a few welcomes that came and refused it because of the Johnson and Johnson. So we're talking about uh, your name. So we're talking about integrity. Uh, people are not. Um, blind to the fact that uh, Johnson & Johnson had uh, altercation with the powder, which was given ovarian cancer, and they knew about it for 10 years, and they settled out of court for a big, massive class action lawsuit and paid a whole bunch of money. So that says to an average Joe like me who's, who's, who's thinking a little bit that uh, it's an integrity issue here. These people will give me anything for the love of the money and you know let, let people die from it and then say sorry later so they definitely have a, a cloud over their head and uh i couldn't really say anything when people take that position concerning johnson and johnson floor is open scholars beth well, uh, yeah well i was gonna say it was interesting in one of my zoom groups um one of the members was in the clinical trial study for J and J, so he had actually been inoculated last July or August and had no issues with it at all. Um, and then um, he actually asked to be unblinded from the blind study because when the vaccines were coming out, he wanted to go ahead. So they unblinded him, and he had, in fact, had the the um, vaccination, you know, the J, J vaccine. And so it was interesting to see how that kind of. Boy, right when she got to the punch. I know, point, right. She'll come back. I don't know if she'll come back. I got to figure out what that punchline was. I know, sometimes it's like five Changed seconds. Changed people's oh, there we go. comfort. Back up just a bit. You, 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 uh, you froze just a bit, Beth. Um, 15 yeah. seconds ago. <laughs> so right, when, right when he was unblinded, go from there. Oh, so when he was unblinded and explained to the group, oh, it's telling me I'm unstable. <laughs> In so many ways, I'm unstable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when he expressed to the group that he found out that he, in fact, had gotten the vaccine, it really changed how everybody felt. They were like, oh, um, and and to actually be able to talk to someone who had had the vac vaccine, had had no issues with it, was in the same age group and cohort. Um, and so that really seemed to alleviate a lot of people's concerns. So somehow in the communications, you know, from J and J, if they, again, could have had more um, individuals who had actually been through that experience to be able to speak to it. So, I must admit, I took the Johnson and Johnson because I only wanted one. I said, <laughs> if I'm going to have some side effects, I only want side effects one time, not two times. <laughs> and I don't regret it. But, you know, it's a stigma now when people find out you had Johnson and Johnson. In fact, my goddaughter and her mother call me every day to see how they call me Miss Johnson and Johnson. Oh, <laughs> uh, because 
they tried to talk me out of taking Johnson and Johnson, but I wanted Johnson and Johnson and I waited for it. And, but like I said, people are, I mean, they call me every day to see how Miss Johnson and Johnson is doing. Oh, I had no side effects. And I really still feel comfortable that I did the right thing for me. And it's all, it all boils down to what's good for you. Mm. And you got to, um, in the Bible, it said, whatever is not of faith is sin. I did this out of faith that this was right for me. Okay. It might not be right for anybody else, but it was right for me. Okay, Sandra. Yeah, it's just, I was gonna um, sort of reach back to Katrina and Mike too. I mean, you you saw things happen on Monday. I mean, part of the barrier Joy might be facing is literally, you know, uh, all the clinics are doing a work day when she's in her shop, you know, um, some of the things like that. Did you hear stuff about just barrier, just plain practical barriers um, on yeah. Monday and and in your talking to your clients? Uh, absolutely, you see barriers. Um, the barriers really stem deeper than just the vaccine. Uh, when you go into, uh, I found for me personally, when, when, when you dig into people and trying to get that why, why won't you take a position to be vaccinated to stop the spread of the coronavirus that's wreaking havoc in our community? Why won't you stop? Why won't you stop? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, why won't you get vaccinated? And they they go back to back in the day. Uh, the system hasn't been good to our people. Why should I trust them now? Um, Tuskegee, they go back to Tuskegee. I know we can shed a light on just Tuskegee. It was a terrible thing that happened to Tuskegee. I'm not saying they should get a pass for it, but they really not gonna do nothing about it for they're not going to cut you a check because of Tuskegee so uh you're stuck there and you, you to me you're you're freezing the you're stagnating the the potential of getting back to some type of normalcy even though they're going to open up anyway it's still a lot of people out here that's that don't feel like it's ready yet and it's not but if we don't the economy will collapse so it's like why won't you take a position to be safe? If you're doing nothing, nothing happens. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. So you got to take a position to get vaccinated. And, and that's, that's my push, if that answers your question. So this is interesting. So as we're talking about like joy in the contemplation phase, I've heard sort of like, Mike, to your point, on two different fronts, like lack of trust in community health systems. So like historically, we've not been well represented or well taken care of by the government. Also, no lack of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. I was saying, no question, you're absolutely right. With the, the systemic racism throughout our past uh, is getting better now, but we haven't seen a point to where like it's a change. Uh, we can, and this, the same thing I'm saying, I'm just repeating from different conversations that I've had with my clients that it goes back down to this. Uh, I can tell you 40 black people who were shot down by police officers in the last many years, so and so many years. Can you tell me how many white people, how many Chinese people, how many any other race been shot down like that? And uh, they go back, it always leads to the, the systemic racism from our past that still follows us to this day. And I mean, I can't really blame them for that, but I try to steer them to the fact that the coronavirus is out here, it's landing on your doorstep. You, you know, you don't want it to land. It's landing on your neighbor's doorstep, maybe not yours yet, but that's what we're trying to prevent from it landing on your doorstep. And people taking the position to understand where I'm coming from, you know, they, they're stuck. They're stuck in their ways. And, you know, if you don't move, you can't get across the street. You know, and we're trying to get across the street. Well, a lot of people want to stay on the other side saying they want to get over there, but they won't walk across the street. And I mean, that's where we are. Mm. So it almost sounds like this for a lot of people, just between all the comments, like trust is a really big thing at this contemplation phase. So like 
Mike, you're saying like historically police health system, like not always on our side, the, the J and J vaccine as well of like, can we really trust this vaccine? Um, you know, like that there was some trial results that weren't great, the baby powder thing. And then also, you know, as you're saying, Mike, like actually in the community, like um, when you're trying to say, well, we've been really hard hit by the pandemic and, and people just not trusting the information. Um, and so there's sort of like three different sides of trust there. So yeah. I'm curious, like from the group, it feels like those are the really big barriers for people like Joy. Is there anything else that she's in the contemplation phase that we're missing aside from just trust? Like, um, you know, childcare, insurance, or is the trust thing really the three sides of trust there, the, the really important barriers? What, what else would you add other than trust? I don't want to talk again, but I am now distrusting even the government saying that you don't have to wear a mask. I will be wearing a mask. And I, uh, you know, I don't trust them. And I, it, it, I think a lot of it, and I have a, cons I mean, the thought that it's all about economics, about money. That's why everything is opening back up. And go ahead. <laughs> can, other, can other people hear? That's how I feel. I, 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 it goes back to trust again. I don't trust them because I don't think they have my best interest at heart, really. Okay. Um, I was going to say time um, might be a roadblock. Um, I remember when they first started with the vaccination uh, sites that they was talking two, three, four hours. Um, the time that it takes some people, if it was during business hours um, and they were working, couldn't get off to do that or just the two, three hour time frame. Um, from start to finish. Um, I know it's vastly improved because I went to take mine. It barely took an hour and 15 minutes from start to finish at uh, Six Flags. Um, the little drive through, get your vaccination. So that was a plus for me because I only had two hours on my, my work lunch break to get it done. So I know time is an issue. Okay. Great. And so. I feel like this naturally brings us over to the third part of the journey around taking action. So this is the second time we talked about um, the time thing. So we were saying on Monday when we ran the clinic, we we're hearing like people like Joy had to work, they couldn't come. Um, and then Priscilla, you're just sharing like time is a big roadblock for people as well. Um, so what else in, in the action phase for folks like Joy, um, you know, could we think about so there's access accessibility issues like pre registration time, um, transportation, can I get there? Is there public transit? Um, <clears throat> do I need unpaid sick leave? Uh, do I if I get sick from the vaccine? Um, do I need ID? What what other action barriers might exist sort of at the level of someone actually going to, to get a vaccine or joy in this case? So we're now to action phase, Tim? Yeah. Action. What's missing, scholars? I think for a lot of my family members and friends, it was a transportation issue for them. So a couple of them, I had to take them to a vaccination site or get them an Uber to a vaccination site because they didn't have money to get there. So it could have been a financial issue for some people as well. OK, great. And so, you know, they, uh, Katrina, you stay right there for a second. So have you heard about Uber being uh, uh, providing transportation to vaccination sites at no cost? Have you heard yeah, about so that? someone just mentioned that to me. And uh, have you used it or no? Did you, have you used it for anybody? I haven't used it as of yet, no. Okay, well keep your eye and ear open because I hear them saying it, but I've not met anyone that's actually used it yet. I've yeah. seen the signs posted for it, um, suggesting it, and they have it at Six Flags. There's an Uber drop-off location. 
Um, so I saw that, but the problem with that is Uber's not going to ride through um, all of that miles and miles of parking to get to come pick you up because, okay, they can get you in there and drop you off, but how they going to pick you up? So you all the way inside Six Flags where the driver has to come and drop you off. And then when it's over, you got to walk all the way back out to Central Avenue or a Main Street to get picked back up again. So I was trying to figure out, well, how was that going to work? <laughs> In other words, you better have a car. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no think chance. they thought it all the way through. <laughs> No, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, I think we've all been in that situation where it's like a, a nightmare to get a car home on the other side of something like this at a, a big site. Um, what, what else at the action phase? So transportation, some good stuff there. Time. What else would would really be in Joy's way at this at this part of um, her vaccination journey? So she has an appointment already, and so this is just getting to the appointment, or? That can be part of it as well. We have pre-registration requirement as a potential um, roadblock here. If she just wants to do a drop-in, but you need to pre-register, that could be one as well. Okay. And we saw that, Kim, uh, for our clinic uh, in the pre-registration, again, when the question came up of which vaccine, uh, we would lose them. I was convinced that that conversation, if it happens face to face rather than over the phone, at least we would know that someone took the time, looked someone in the eye and tried to explain and answer any questions someone had. And then if they walk away then, that's a lot different than walking away on the telephone. Mm. So pre it might be the, the lack of face to face um, opportunity to answer any questions or uncertainties maybe yeah i mean you could be ready to take action and it doesn't take it's a it's a it's fragile it doesn't take much to say you know what i'm not going because uh, there's a story in the paper or something who knows what it might be but taking action is um until the needle goes in the arm anything can come up that could derail it One look at the needle might change mine. <laughs> I look away. <laughs> Is it true that there's more sites now that are actually local? Like I was in my giant the other day and there were chairs and people coming in and out and getting the, you know, I didn't realize that was still even going on. So um, you're actually going to see more of that. So it seems like there's more opportunities and places that are kind of closer. Like I had gone to Six Flags. Right. That's because you're highly, you're, high, you're highly motivated. The big Six Flags are they're closing down because the demand has dropped off. Mm -hmm. So I would say to you, Beth, with now it being so accessible, right. Walmart, CVS, right. what for Joy would stop her at this action moment? It's now accessible, it's easy. What would stop her at this moment that's not currently on the board? Another off the wall news broadcast about something that happened to someone that got the vaccination. So it doesn't have to be big. That's the fragile part. And I guess underlying is fear. <laughs> okay. You know, it's really fear. So the fear follows you all the way to even this moment. And Priscilla is saying, yes, big time. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so we are coming up to dinner time in a few minutes. I just want to quickly, yes, I know it's, it's happening fast. 
Uh, I just want to quickly summarize kind of the biggest roadblocks that we've identified for Joy. And this will be important after the dinner break. And we're going to start to focus on more of the bridges that we can build to help her overcome these roadblocks that we've identified. Um, so in the first phase where Joy is contemplating whether she wants to get her COVID vaccine, there was a lot of um, discussion around the lack of attention to underlying health conditions. Why would she trust the vaccination if she has lack of trust in these other areas, such as diabetes treatment? Um, we talked about information rapidly changing, a lot of emphasis on fear and not really understanding because there's so much information coming from different sources. And there's also this false narrative of vaccine hesitancy. Um, another flareback might be the worst possible scenario. So Mike was saying the community needs to be held responsible um, in light of a second outbreak that might take away the progress that has been made. And so in the next phase we have, um, in the preparation phase, we had a lot of discussion about trust in government, especially with in light of recent events, police brutality, Black Lives Matter, there's a lack of trust in community health systems. Um, and of course, police violence is related to this as well because it's all state orchestrated. There's a lack of trust in vaccines in general and maybe in pharma companies such as Johnson & Johnson. And so there's kind of a social stigma that attached to that as well. Um, when Reverend Jenkins was talking about how she preferred it for the convenience of just having it one time, um, a lot of people, you know, seem to be checking up on her. So there might be a social stigma attached to certain names. And then we have a trust in information. People are very um, overwhelmed by how do I get there? Um, am I going to get sick? There's so much information from different sources. And so that's a really big theme that's coming up. Um, and then in our last phase, in our action phase, our three biggest roadblocks that we found are about time. So just really the practical barriers of when clinics are open and the time to travel there. So transportation, and maybe it's expensive to take an Uber and maybe public transportation doesn't reach those areas. Um, as well as pre-registration that's required. People might easily turn off, like uh, Dr. Thomas was saying, it's a very fragile and fearful experience all the way up until the end. So as soon as I hear something that kind of turns them off, they might hang up the phone and not want to go through with it. So these are kind of the biggest barriers that we've found with Joy over the COVID journey. And so what we're going to do after the dinner break is we're going to contemplate over these, but take a solution mindset. Um, and we're going to try and think of the best bridges that our community already has in order to leverage um, health, uh, health equities and how we want to move towards them. And so your breakout room is going to close in about 40 seconds. Can I say something, um, Kim, real quick? Yes. Go back to uh, prep the next one, not this one, the, in the middle, yes. Reverend Jenkins. I want you to put in parentheses the, 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 the name of endearment they gave her. Would they call you Reverend Jenkins when they call to check up on you? Miss Johnson and Johnson. Okay, <laughs> put Miss Johnson and Johnson, Miss J and J in parentheses. <laughs> so that's what we do in the community. You get a, you get a nickname tied to something. Yeah. <laughs> they probably gonna laugh at that a hundred years from now. Well, let's say 20, we'll be talking about it. Welcome back, everyone. It looks like there was a lot of conversation in your groups and, and we, are, we understand it took some time to truly think like, uh, you know, Joy or like Omar. Uh, and again, I'm, this is part of the struggle, right? We, we really wanna kind of empathize with these individuals who are, as I said, not necessarily fictional. They are fictional, but they're based off of real in people that you may actually know of. Um, all right, so we have two more activities to go. Uh, what we're gonna do is break for dinner right now. We'll take about 20 minutes. Unfortunately, it's a very short dinner, um, but don't worry, feel free to keep, uh, continue having your dinner as we start activity two. Um, so I'm gonna get us to come back uh, by 7.40.
uh, and then we'll slowly ease our way into uh, activity two right after dinner. So we should stay in the Hollywood Squares. Are you going to put yes. some music on in the background? We will. Yes. <laughs> Please do not navigate away from the Zoom yeah, window. Keep that open. Just mute yourself uh, or you know turn off your video if you'd like to. But stay here. Um, we'll have a timer up and going, but we'll uh, kick things back up again at 7.40. Very good. Have a nice dinner, scholars. I'm waiting for DoorDash. <laughs> I hear you.
Hi everyone. Hope you are having your dinner right now. We have about uh, three minutes left till we get back to uh, we'll head into activity two. Uh, we are running a little over, but that's okay. We'll try and make up some time in activity two and three. But uh, if I can ask you all to get back to your seats, uh, your desks, tables. Um, again, feel free to keep having your dinner through activity two, um, but we will um, start to, uh, we'll, we'll head into our next activity very soon. So please make your way back to your desks um, with your dinner uh, or beverage or snack if you like. Uh, and while you're heading back, we've got a little Zoom poll going about um, food stops that you um, that, that you like that you uh, like in high school. Uh, Michelle, do you want to? I think uh, you should see. You should be able to see a poll in your uh, Zoom window. It's just a little quick poll, you know. Just while you're having dinner, uh, we've listed a few uh, food uh, joints in uh, Prince in Hyattsville that I see folks have already started voting. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, just some you know places that uh, you really like uh, from, from this list. If, if your uh, preferred food stop is not on the list, just feel free to type it away in the chat. The motion, this is Dr. T, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, I, I like your music collection. Who is this? Uh, hold on one second, I'm just gonna... Uh, Michelle, would you mind turning down the music a little? It sounds a little bit like Joe Bean. I, 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 Brazilian. I, I, I believe this is a uh, got like some stock music on uh, on, on Negro, so I'm not fully sure who this is, but. It is nice, right, for a Wednesday. Oh, you're, so you're telling me I somehow like Muzak. <laughs> Something I hear in an elevator. Okay. Yeah, okay. this is like elevator music. There you go. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, El folks, we are just a few And with that sound effect, we will uh, get back to our activity. Okay. okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Um, again, we don't mean to rush you through your dinner. So please, by no means, do, do, please continue having your dinner uh, or your snack or your beverage if you need to. Um, in the interest of time, we still have, we're only, you know, one third in our journey, by the way. So we still have quite some ground to cover. So um, we are going to get into, get, go straight into our activity two now. Uh, and before I send us off into our buses uh, with Joy or with Omar, I just want to kind of, you know, give you a bit of a heads up of, of for what to expect. So in activity one, we discussed roadblocks, right? Um, we, we spoke about the COVID-19 vaccine journey for Joy or uh, Omar and we, we had a good conversation about, you know, some of the big, as well as some of the smaller, uh, you know, roadblocks that, uh, that people like Omar and Joy faced. Now in activity two, we're gonna skip over to the positive side of things. What were the things that really worked in, uh, from the COVID vaccine response? Again, for the same two individuals, Joy and Omar, think about the bridges that actually were built um, in Omar's and, uh, and uh, Joy's journey. We're going to talk about that and try and kind of have a conversation about the most impactful of those bridges, those initiatives, those partnerships, uh, solutions, what have you. And then we'll carry them over to activity three 
which is where we'll change off, change into our kind of new journey later on. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna reopen uh, our breakout rooms and have you all join. You should see it. Hello, hello, welcome back. How was everyone's dinner? <laughs> it was good. Short. <laughs> yeah, okay, Pringles. <laughs> non existent. We had cherry. And, and Priscilla, let me just say, it's a pleasure getting to meet you. We haven't, <laughs> we haven't hung out together before like this. Thank you. So much for <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, okay, so like Rosa mentioned, you can snack, don't worry about it. Um, I'm just going to talk or we're going to talk for a few more minutes before we need any uh, discussion time. So please feel free to keep eating or munching away. Um, so for the next portion of the workshop, um, we're going to now take a look at some of the roadblocks that we identified throughout Joy's journey. Um, but we're actually going to change the hat. We're going to switch hats and we're going to try and think about um, how we can help resolve some of these roadblocks. What are the bridges that we can build to help people like Joy overcome these roadblocks? And so I'm just going to give you some time to, to settle down, get back in the mindset, and I'll review the roadblocks once, I, once again. And so... Um, thank you, Tim, for copying these over from activity one. In phase one of contemplation, we identified that some things that Joy might encounter in this stage is lack of attention to the underlying issues, uh, the underlying health conditions that are not being addressed by the local health authorities or government, unreliable information. So information about the vaccine is rapidly changing. There's a false uh, narrative, a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity, um, a lot of difficulty navigating that. And then in phase two for preparation, we said that um, there's continued lack of trust in community health systems here as well. Um, lack of trust in vaccines and pharma industry, especially the things that were coming out about Johnson & Johnson. Uh, lack of trust in information. There's a lot of information about where to get it, which one to get, how can I get there? So you have to weave through all of that in deciding and preparing um, to get vaccinated. And then when people like Joy actually act, want to act on their decision and decide that they do want to get vaccinated, there's roadblocks about time, uh, taking the time to get there or going to a clinic that's open after work hours, um, getting transportation there. If there is no public transportation, how will I take an Uber there or even harder, get back? Um, and then pre-registration and taking, and taking action um, to make the appointment and book the appointment and how that can be a very fragile um, stay up until the very, very end. And so with all these in mind, these will always be on this board here. So, and at any time, if you want to remind yourself about them, please let me know and I can easily scroll back up. Um, but we want to take the next 20 ish minutes to look at some of these bridges. And so these are initiatives and partnerships that have come out of research and that Communivax has identified as existing in your communities already. Um, and so some of these categories are very similar to activity one. Uh, we're going to go through them stage by stage is one leadership. Um, so the prominent leaders taking the vaccine on camera, such as uh, Angela also Brooks. We've heard that that helps a lot of people discover about the vaccine or faith leaders calling on community to get vaccinated. Programs such as the free, free lunch programs for adults at the First United Methodist Church, Mona Center Urban Farm, et cetera. Uh, maybe workers unions promoting vaccine adoption. And then we have a lot, a lot about social media and information and the information that you can find there, such as the Facebook Live and YouTube town halls, press conferences, uh, the public libraries that people often use people like Joy often use to um, access computers and Wi-Fi, 
public flyers and ads tailored to local sentiments, um, asking, or instead of, are you excited? Maybe they're saying, are you concerned? Because a lot of people in that area are concerned about it. Uh, free newspapers and flyers distributed at metro stations, Twitter accounts, citizen science apps, radio stations yet again, a graphic novel that Dr. T is working on about fighting the COVID vaccine. So other visual methods of debunking vaccine information and maybe some hotlines and helplines that help provide information in English and in Spanish. And so when I talk about these kinds of initiatives and bridges, do any of them stand out to you as, oh yes, I've, I've seen that, I've come across that, or that's helped someone like me in discovering the COVID vaccine? And then when you think so, about helping someone like you, do you think it helps someone like Joy? Joy. And what might yeah. be missing here that Joy might need? So floor is open, scholars. And Michelle, do you just want to zoom out so we can see the barriers that we identified for Joy as well? Yes. So I'll actually just drag them down. Oh, sure. Michelle, if you want to just move down, I could just do the dragging. All right, scholars, this floor is open. What's a bridge for you, a bridge for joy? I think uh, availability, now they have removed pre-registration requirements as well as um, making them available in retail stores, Giant, Safeway, um, Walmart, make it, bringing it to the community. I think those, those have been very important bridges that um, one of my church members got hers that Sunday. She just happened to be in Walmart and they told, she saw the, um, the site and she went ahead and got the vaccine. So I think the, the availability and lack of registration, pre-registration requirements have done a lot. So let's stay there just for a moment. So she's she's going somewhere. Oh, I'm going to go to, where was she? Walmart? So she's going to Walmart to do her thing. And oh, they're giving the vaccine here. Why not get it? That kind of convenience. Okay. And she talked two other people into getting it when she got hers, and <laughs> a, a mother and a son. Okay. So uh, she even invited them and they took it too. And she felt very good about that. You know, we saw that also. People, after they got over their fear, got their vaccine, they went out and brought friends in. And that was better than any commercial. <laughs> what else, scholars? <laughs> I think for me, what I've, what I've seen a lot of is just having trust in relationships with people, having relationships with like family and friends that they can trust you. Because I've seen people that was very hesitant in getting the vaccination. But once we had dialogue about the vaccination and me telling them my experience with the vaccination, they, they wanted to be vaccinated. They just needed to have someone other than, I guess, a healthcare provider that they can trust and that can tell you about their experiences. But wait, let me make sure I understand. They wanted to hear from someone who was not a medical professional. Correct. Just a, 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 a person that they could relate to. Yes, exactly. Family and friends. I think for me, um, like all these social media and information, you know, next door and you know, flyers and all that. The thing that pops out to me is that there's really no one source that I feel confident about that I could like pick up the phone, you know, it talks about hotlines and helplines, but all the information is like county by county, um, you know, and each county has their own, you know, ways of registering and sites and so if there could be some way to consolidate, make it mo more cohesive, even within a county, all these sources of information so that you knew that they were credible. And maybe even that, you know, to have the possibility of 
speaking to someone like a information line or a hotline. So, so um, Beth, has there been an institution that you used to feel comfortable with that now you've lost that comfort, like the CDC or any of those agencies? Um, well, I do, I do feel the CDC has been a little herky jerky. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, certainly on the national news, but I'm just trying to think of, again, it's that being overwhelmed with so much information. And is there like, um, I guess years ago, I might have picked up the phone and called my primary care provider and okay. said, um, what's your thought? You know, what's your recommendation? Blah, blah, blah. But the, even those relationships are, are fractured. Everything is so disintegrated. There's just like no comprehensive or cohesive way to get information or even to test the information. And so a lot of it goes on hearsay. So I think friends and family is good and important. Um, but there can be a lot of myths or... Um, stresses that get exacerbated that way too. Yeah. And I feel like this is a pretty relatable barrier barrier like when we think about joy and just the challenge of like information changing rapidly there's no sort of one source of truth and I'm curious right like for many of you you've been pretty involved in your community and things like using barbershops or um, town halls online are in some ways sort of strategies to try and make up for how distributed information is. I'm, I'm curious what people's perceptions of the most effective things have been like in the vein of town halls or with barbershops or other strategies that have kind of helped to fill that gap left by all the information that goes everywhere online. Well, I think in some ways like people would get it from their faith community, you know, cause they were going every Sunday or Saturday or, you know, whatever day and, you know, Bible study during the week. And, you know, so COVID kind of fractured all of that. Even libraries, you know, lots of individuals would go into the library and now you don't have access to that. Um, so I think the, the places are out there, but COVID kind of fractured and split them. Yeah. And have there been new things that have cropped up during COVID as those things have fractured that um, have been helpful, like gathering places, whether online or different places in neighborhoods? Yeah. What's also interesting about what you're saying, Beth, um, is you're kind of naturally leaning into the next part of this question, where we want to think about how we might sustain some of these bridges and what your community mm -hmm. needs to continue using and benefiting from them. And so when you mention things like the faith community and the public libraries, um, how can we continue to use these resources and how can we continue to sustain the value that they brought us? And so one of the things you already mentioned is having one distinct kind of hotline and helpline that everyone trusts as the source of truth to consolidate all the resources to help credibility. Um, so anything like more in that vein, um, how can we do that for the faith community and for public libraries, for example? And this is to everyone, not just Beth. <laughs> And let me jump in too, and this is Sandra, and, and ask especially like um, <clears throat> um, my Katrina, Reverend Jenkins, you know, as community health workers, as a pastor, what would help you be that, you know, you or, um, you know, other shops, other churches, you know, be sort of that source of reliable, what would you need to help you do that for joy? I think just having correct information to be able to share with her and also just be able to um, 
help her get understanding of the things that she don't understand. Like just refer her to CDC or healthcare professionals that can answer any of those questions she may have that we couldn't uh, answer for, for her. Uh, for me, uh, after you have explained yourself uh, to the best of your ability with the factual information and they're still at a point of uh, saying no. Uh, I, what do you do? Uh, you just pray for them and uh, pray it doesn't land on the doorstep and, and keep it moving. Uh, mm -hmm. And on, on to the next one, you just got to keep you got to keep on with your factuals and uh, maybe maybe they'll see it, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll stick with their position. But for me, I, I like to get the person that I'm talking to, the individual that I'm talking to, and they're all different and they all have different perspectives on why they're not. Uh, I just like to get them to the point of uh, facts. What are your facts? What are your facts of why you're taking this position to say no? Tell me factually why you're saying no and make me understand where your no is coming from. Where is your no? Why, why is your no? I, I wanna know why. Why are you saying no? And let's start there and go nowhere else with the conversation. Let's box them into the corner and answer that question. And once we get there, then maybe they can find out why they're saying no. Mm -hmm. so, so Mike, let me see if I understand. And you're not shaming, you're not blaming, you're just saying I'm not, no. conversation. <laughs> We're having real talk here. It's real talk. And uh, for me, Dr. T, uh, and I don't uh, want to offend anyone. And, and if I am, please forgive me. Is I, I'm not, I, I, I just, I'm from a stance point now that, I mean, I was, I was one of the ones in the front. Hell no, I'm not taking that shot. Why would I take that shot? No, I was that until I did the research. And once you do the research, uh, the, the facts are there. Uh, it's still some unknowns. However, uh, the side effects uh, for me couldn't be no worse than drinking all night and, and your stomach is messed up for two days. You can't eat, you can't drink. Every time you eat something, you're sick. Uh, that lasts two or three days. Everybody gets through that. But for me is you can do that or, or any other thing that you've done that's not good for your body or whatever, but stopping the spread of the coronavirus is where you draw the line. I, I don't, I, it doesn't equate to me. I, I know so many clients who are drinkers, they, they drink themselves to, oh, I'm hurting the next day. Don't get their stomach back right for two or three days. But the vaccine is where you draw the line. I don't get that one. And uh, we, for people who say no, and I don't have anything against them because that's their body and their right. What I do want to have with those people who take that position is, what's your why? Does your why make sense? And is your why helping this to stop the spread of the coronavirus, which is why we're all on this call? So one question I'll try and probe a little bit more is we're, we're hearing a lot of having the facts, having the correct information, having the correct resources to share, um, I guess, up until we get to that point where maybe there's a lot of resistance and they're not going to accept that new information. Is there anything around the, the method of delivering that information that seems to work better or resonate better with people in your in in your life? Because um, I know we've mentioned a lot of social media or public flyers or graphic novels, or do you find that the face-to-face -face interaction is really just the best way to do it? Absolutely, the face-to-face the, the -face for me is uh, the best because uh, you, it, it's, a, it's a direct conversation between you and I, and I can meet eye to eye and I can see you know, where you're coming from 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 how you're giving me your answers back. Um, you really heard it from somebody that you respect a lot that they're not taking the shot. So you've taken that shot because you respect that person, but that person has no facts. 
and it goes on down the line. And he, and when you get back to the end of it, it started with great grandma who said, don't trust the government because they oppressed the people for so long that that thinking has trickled all the way down to the vaccine here in 2021. I'm not saying that uh, racial inequities are not uh, out here for people to see because they are, they're very prevalent for you to see. I'm not telling you to disarm yourself either, but what I am saying is the coronavirus is real and it's really real when it lands on your doorstep. And that's what we're trying to prevent, uh, the heartache that it caused because uh, people may have diabetes, people may have underlying conditions and some of them didn't know that they had the underlying conditions, but the coronavirus told you you did and unfortunately it took you out. And uh, just with a little, just with the vaccine, it, I explained this to someone today, it's like if you're walking down the street and someone behind you, you didn't even know was coming and just comes to sucker punch you, boom, when they hit you and you miscombobulated, you don't know what hit you. You, you, you went out, the lights are out. That's the same thing as the coronavirus does to your body without the vaccine. It, it hits your body and your body doesn't know what it is and it takes it on strong. By the time it know what to do, it's too late. But with the vaccine, you have something that says, hey, look, this man trying to hit you while you're walking past me. Turn around and look. So now you have some defense trying to protect you from the vicious attack of the unseen. So until we can get people to look at it on that level, now I don't have the answer for what it would do to you 10, 12 years from now. I don't have that. And if you're thinking that far ahead, then we're still gonna be here. And we're trying to get from here, at least that's the initiative I thought, to get to back to some type of normalcy without people being scared to come outside or, or all that mess. It's just a whole bunch of mess. So, so it's a whole I, bunch of mess. I just wanna say, I, I just like your analogies and I'm hoping that as we're listening to come up with analogies because I've never heard these from the CDC or Dr. Fauci or any of them, your analogies help people assess risk. And that's what needs to be done. That's what the graphic novel was about. It's, it's sad to say, and I, I don't even like to repeat it, but they, it's sad to say I've heard it in, the, in, in, in the, uh, my community before. If, if you want to keep something from a black man, put it in a book. <laughs> and it's sad to say, it's very sad. Unfortunately, it has some validity. Uh, but if you make a book with a lot of pictures and showing you that what can happen to you if you don't do this, and they can see it more, they're more visual learners than they are readers. And uh, it's unfortunate to say, but it's, it's just true. And you have to fit the shape of the container and meet the people where they are when you're trying to get a point across uh, with that, you're trying to get a point across that can save lives. You, you have to take, you have to turn into the shape of the container. You have to be water in order to reach every level. And uh, that's what the frustration is trying to do because you have some people who have no factuals, no, it's all fiction, it's what they heard and they're not taking the position to try to stop the coronavirus, which is wreaking havoc in our community at an extremely alarming rate. And we need, we need to address that by any means necessary. So if I have to be water to get it across, then so be it. Yeah. And so it, it sounds like, so a minute ago, we were talking about like just the, the nature of information online being everywhere. And then we've been talking a little bit about like actually having conversations with family and friends or in the barber shop. And so it sounds like we can't really do anything about the internet, <laughs> but um, like the one-on-one -on -one conversations, it sounds like have been really impactful in the community. Oh, wow. Um, it, so is that, instead of just going for information, is, is the thing that we're actually talking about really being the types of relationships that we've started to turn on during the pandemic have been really helpful for people like Joy and, and moving them along? Well, um, I don't know who has who Joy has come into contact with. Uh, the people that she met may not have the same delivery as, as I. Uh, um, 
you just have to meet that person where they are and try to help them to understand the best way possible to understand what the coronavirus is doing and what the vaccine prevents it from doing and what it does to stop you from getting it? Absolutely not. Does it help you? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the, the guy, uh, Bill Morrow, he just came down with the diagnosis again, but he said he was doing quite well. And uh, even though he tested positive again, he, he's doing quite well because he's vaccinated. And that's the type of information that needs to get out there. But I don't see that all over the internet. You got to Google it and search it to find it. But they need to be broadcasting that. Uh, Bill Maher is vaccinated. He came up, he tested positive for the second time, but he's doing well. They need to promote that. That needs, to, the world needs to know that. On his platform, where he reaches million, he needs to take a position to promote that information. Yeah, I caught it the second time, but I'm doing well because I'm vaccinated. Yes. They, he needs to take a position to do that. He has, he has a, a great position to spread how he's feeling after he contracted it the second time. And he's home drinking mimosas, I guess, chilling, waiting to, <laughs> waiting to stop the quarantine. Uh, that's, that's, that's definitely good information. That's definitely good information for the people to know, for people who contracted it, who's not vaccinated and end up on a ventilator. He's home drinking mimosas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if I had to get the COVID, I, I'd rather be home drinking mimosas too. So, <laughs> so get, get get vaccinated. <laughs> we could put that in the graphic novel, definitely. <laughs> I'm also yeah. hearing that there are, because it is better to have these face-to-face -face interactions than to be able to tell and share these stories. Um, I'm seeing these bridges here that we have in phase two of preparation as quite relevant actually because people like you for example Mike you are um, a barber but you've also been identified as a community health worker and so you have this a great opportunity to meet people where they are like you said be water if you need to be water and you're already in a convenient place for them to meet you and trust you and talk to you um, so I want to bring us kind of to these uh, bridges here and ask if there we've already kind of touched upon these but ask if there are any add-ons to um, bridges in the preparation phase and helping joy decide and really prepare so we've got training barbers as one I'll put that down here you've got stories of relevant popular celebrities and people um socializing how much better they're doing because they are vaccinated. I'm hearing something similar to an AMA style session because this allows you a chance to really ask the tough questions and get the information right away. So Mike, uh, Katrina, uh, and any of the others who've been in our town halls, do you think it matters when we bring up Fauci or a Michael Osterholm into a town hall with the, the folk from the community? No. no. <laughs> go ahead, Priscilla. That's like you might, yeah, no, it yeah. doesn't. Mike, Mike, go ahead and then Priscilla take the mic. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, no, it, it doesn't make a difference. You could have said, Ronald Reagan said, they, oh, they, they don't care. They, they, the wall that we're at now, I like to call it the hell no wall because that's what you get. They tell you, hell no, I'm not taking it and they don't have a reason why. And it's very frustrating for me. I know I don't want to be reiterating the same thing over and over again, but it's the same conversation that I get with different people they, that takes the same uh, position to say no. They don't want to be vaccinated. They don't have a reason why. They're just saying no. And, and uh, uh, Priscilla? A famous celebrity, sports star, you're muted. I think you could have asked Beyonce to come. Everybody's going to show up because it's Beyonce. <laughs> but, I'm always going to refer to myself. So for me, all I want is the truth. I want facts and I want truth. If that's 
me having to do a public service announcement. Hey, my name is Priscilla. I was scared as beep to take the vaccination. However, I wanted to spend time with my family and go on a family vacation. So what did I have to do? I had to get the vaccination. Yes, it hurt. Yes, I felt bad. Yes, I still have questions, but there's like this, I'd rather have this much of uncertainty about what lies ahead than to have none and be in that bracket of, of I just don't know. So I have this much, you know, certainty versus this much uncertainty. And I, I feel a little bit more comfortable. I don't like what I had to go through the process to get to this point and I'm not comfortable with it. I have a ton of questions about my future and what lies ahead for myself and those around me. But my bottom line is I'm not in this much uncertainty. I have, you know, this much clarity and that much clarity is a long ways from this much uncertainty for me. I like that. Yeah. And, and, and a commercial, somebody who's not a celebrity, an everyday person, mm -hmm. Holds credibility compared to the famous names. For me, it would because the famous name got paid to do the commercial. I'm not asking you. Just let me tell my truth. I'd rather, I'd rather be 100% sure, knowing that for me, Priscilla, everybody knows Priscilla's going to tell the truth regardless. Okay. And because they know me through my church or through my employment with the county or however they know me, they know, well, we know Priscilla's not going to lie for nothing. She told the truth. Yeah, it, this is where she was. This is where she is. And that works for them. If Priscilla could do it, dog want it because they know I hate needles. Like I will a needle what? I haven't had the flu shot in more than 10 years. Okay. So you're asking me to present my body. And I only did that because I had a con I have a condition called fibromyalgia. So I was always fearful <clears throat> with all of the medication where the vaccination would place me because there was no understanding. And I didn't have a factual person to tell me, well, I got it. I have fibromyalgia. I got the Pfizer and Priscilla is a month out. I'm okay. And so there's just, there was that fear and that's what kept me. You're talking, we were 15 months in and I'm just now getting the vaccination because I was afraid. So I feel a lot more comfortable with someone like myself telling their story versus someone like Beyonce, you know, because when I look at her, I'm not thinking about a vaccination. When I look at a sports person, I'm not thinking about a vaccination. I'm thinking about them shoes, their gear, their music, what they do. For, I'm not thinking about that. So uh, uh, a well-known person doesn't do crap for me. I just give me a real life person like myself or like any one of you all. Not saying that, you know, you guys aren't celebrities in your own minds or whatever, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> that is so, that is so funny. That is so funny because I, I have a client that has been vaccinated and she has fibromyalgia that's the heart condition correct no fibromyalgia is a condition yes it kind of sort of does but mostly fibromyalgia is a condition that affects your muscles so uh -huh. things that they were saying that you get from taking the vaccination is what i live with 24 hours a day seven days a week muscle hurting Muscle pain, uh, intense muscle pain. Oh, did I say muscle pain? So, and it's been two weeks since I got it. I still have trouble lifting my arm. I want to tell that truth to anybody who asked me. Yeah, I got it. Two weeks out, I'm still three, two, two and a half, three weeks out. I still have trouble lifting my arm. So there's still some tenderness for me, but is that the fibromyalgia or is that the vaccination? No matter, I'm going to tell my truth and that's all I have to stand on. So that's what I'm going to. Absolutely. 
to people. Yeah, but fibromyalgia attacks your muscles and um the muscle, yeah. Yeah, it's a her, muscle. Her, hers issue. is in her heart. I know she said something about my algae and it's by her heart. I know she said something like that. That's it, it rang a bell when you said that name. That's why that I, my algae. That my algae is nobody's friend. <laughs> <laughs> so Priscilla, I'm curious, like we've talked about um, the virtual town halls, we've talked mm -hmm. about barber shops, we've talked about churches, mm -hmm. like all at areas where, you know, people like you can share their experience with the vaccine specifically. And I'm wondering, like, what do you think has been the most effective thing that's cropped up in COVID where people are able to tell their story and other people in the community can hear it? The as far as like uh, how the they're getting their message out there to people like myself yeah or yeah like where are they able to go share that in a community um, for me that? for me i found uh i found it on the various platforms for my condition um, um i'm in several fibromyalgia groups on facebook and so there's always the question have you got your vaccination yet um and every day they want it's a group called or it's a app called people like me and so i'm a member of several fibromyalgia groups and so there's this push to get us vaccinated and everybody's telling their message or leaving little videos you know or taking their pictures showing their vaccination um and that kind of helped me a little bit but i was still just so very afraid but it helped me to make my decision to go ahead and get it done and and uh I don't know if I answered your question. That and the fact that I want to go to Myrtle Beach with my family in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> if right. I don't get the vaccination, I can't go to the Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's very personal. And this is what I have very in personal. TV commercials where it's, it's not about science per se. At the end of the day, when you get down to this part of the journey, it's about, can I go to the wedding? Can I go to a, a funeral? Or for this, go to something really, really fun and not be left out. Because everybody's going to be asking, who's going to be there, right? Aren't you going to ask Priscilla? And have they been vaccinated? <laughs> factual. Very factual, Dr. Thomas. Very factual. Yeah. Now, Reverend Jenkins, it's all voluntary. We have no no verification <clears throat> in this country like they do in other countries. Is that something that uh, that Joy should be concerned about? In other words, we don't always talk about our health status, but is this something where where those of us who have been vaccinated, or when Joy gets vaccinated, that she should tell others, celebrate mm -hmm. it, uh, get up in church and give a testimony? Is that something that could happen? Well. My church and most of the, I look at a lot of churches online and most of them have been encouraging their congregations to get the vaccine. And in one of our earliest town halls or whatever, I let uh, the researchers know that when I saw them getting the vaccine, until I saw them, when I saw Dr. Thomas get his, then I felt, you know, hey, I can talk from experience. And if, 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 if the people I look up to don't feel uh, comfortable, why would I do it? But I was just thinking about the fact that that's a topic on everybody's mind now. Everybody, everybody you talk to, even in our prayer circles, people are praying about the vaccine praying about COVID and protection. I did want to ask Mike, do you service customers who don't have on masks? Because I, I still think that that's a lot of what we need to focus on. And my pastor made a end at the end of our service. He said, please wear your mask. Please, you know, whatever. And well, yeah, uh, um... go ahead. Well, yes, I, I do service people because uh, they wear their masks all the way up until my chair. And when they're in the chair, uh, the beard, your beard and your facial hair is a part of 
the haircut. So you do remove your mask. However, I do have a small fan that I have on the next station next to me that's uh, uh, locked at an angle where it's constantly blowing. Uh, it's constantly blowing the air this way. Like, so if they're talking, I know it comes out of their breath and they have it. So you can get caught in the air and, and blow. Uh, and I have on my mask as well. It's just, it's just a lot of things you got to work through. Um, of course, I'm, anybody that gets in my chair, I'm, I'm very, you know, aware that they could be carrying the, the, the coronavirus and give it to me. Uh, it, it's a part of being a frontline worker that they won't give us the credit for. They, they never said that barbers and stylists was frontline workers. We are. Um, it's something that we had to work through from day one. Uh, uh, I guess uh, since we're talking about churches, uh, I, I am a man of faith. And uh, I do pray that uh, I'm protected and kept from all hurt, harm, and danger around me every day, as well as my family and loved ones, as far as this coronavirus is concerned. And uh, I found out uh, that, well, I don't find that I've just been lucky enough or blessed enough, or however you want to say it, not to come across anyone who has had this terrible virus. Okay. Well, every day, uh, and Joy, who's a, a beautician, uh, every day is facing on the job a potential exposure because of no the question. come into her shop. Yeah. So, 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 Mike and, and Katrina, since uh, we're talking about these front line, would you um, think that all barbers and stylists in the roles that you play should be vaccinated? No question. Absolutely. You, for me. For me, you owe it to you owe it to your clientele, you owe it to your community, you owe it to anybody that you service, mm -hmm. you owe it to anybody that you service from letting them feel at ease that uh, you can't pass it to me or uh, any way you could be feeling. Mike not vaccinated, I'm going to get it, and I got it from him, or, or you never know where you're going to get it from. But just to play the position of being safe for your client who pays your bills. And I, they pay my they they pay me well they pay, they pay me well I, I got to take a position to protect them as well as my family. You, That's true. You tell them that you and Katrina you tell them that you you've done this for yourself your family and to protect them. No yes, question. I did. So, I, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I took I took a position to protect you. And I don't want to I don't want to make or, or or point anybody out who took a position not to take it. But I tell them like it is, I'm protecting you because you too foolish enough not to protect yourself or your family. <laughs> and that's what, and we go from, that's the relationship we have. You can talk to them like that. So you, Since you so, yeah, I, I let them have it. And <laughs> some of them like it, some of them don't. I, I, I see you next week. <laughs> 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 so, so Tim, there's one of the keys, the relationship is ongoing, not a one time, it's not transactional, like you're showing up at a CVS or something. It's an actual ongoing relationship. Yeah. And that is, to me, is where you need to plant. It, it, it starts with your personal relationships first, because then they're gonna go and they're gonna talk to other people and repeat what I said to them. and. Thank God they've come to a, a trusted source that knows knows what everybody else should know about the coronavirus. And they're going to repeat correct information when it comes from my platform. And I take pride in that. So yeah. you go repeat what I said. Yes. I smack you on the butt and get you in the game like, like a dude coming off the bench in the basketball game. Get out there and tell them the information. <laughs> and they, they do it. That, and they spread it. It starts with you. You, you'd be surprised how far, I mean, if you had to track the people that you've spoken to about it and they went to repeat it to people that, uh, 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 of a group of their peers, yeah. you'd be surprised how far your word traveled. But you know that you came from a sound source. So I feel good about it because I know I came from a sound source and can be backed by fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
This is great. I feel like we've talked a lot about trust and leveraging community relationships around it and the ways in which it's really helpful to connect with people and talk about it. Um, when we were talking about joy and some of the barriers before, we talked about stuff outside of trust that was a little more like the logistics of daily life. We talked about time and transportation and pre-registration over the internet being barriers for joy. I'm curious, um, so we already talked a little bit about um, time, for example, and solutions. So we talked about earlier, 10 minutes ago, like Walmart and CVS. And so there's an example of someone going to Walmart because they had to shop and bringing to, you know, mother and son along and getting them vaccinated. I I'm curious for people, what are the things that you've seen in the community crop up that have really helped people like Joy with some of the barriers around time and transportation and pre-registration? Well, uh, firstly, I can say my position, uh, because as, as I'll tell you once again, in the beginning, I was saying, hell no. And a lot of people were saying, hell no. Yeah, Mike, yeah, let's go. Hell no. And when I started doing the research because I needed to know I work with the School of Public Health. I remember when Dr. T came in the beginning and we were on colorectal cancer and I jumped right on because I lost my dad to that. And I was passionate about keeping the community safe. And I saw that from my platform, I could take a position to bring wellness into my community. I was all on board, but when the coronavirus hit and they was talking about, uh, take the shot, we, we got the shot. It was something about warp, plus speed equaling cure for me. It just didn't do it. Uh, I was like, no, hell no, I'm not doing it. I, I can't do it. As Soon as this thing came out, they got a cure, warp plus speed equal cure. No, I'm not adding that up. That, that doesn't come out right to me. So I had to get into the research of why uh, Dr. T had talked to me uh, night after night, uh, you know, about what were my reasons for the nose and giving me research to look. And through that, I was able to get educated and take a different position. So, you know, I've been called a lot of things behind that from taking the position from saying no at first to taking it, advocating it and being vaccinated uh, on social media. I got called a lot of things. I was uh, Uncle Mike, really Uncle Tom, what they call me <laughs> Uncle Mike. Uh, um, they call me a hypocrite. I'm working for the white man. Uh, oh, they, they've type done it all. In, they, type, they, that they, in the, type that in, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. They, Tim, they, type that in, Tim. <laughs> they, they done everything but stone me. <laughs> I'm looking to be... <laughs> Sell out. Sell out. <laughs> they done everything but stone me. So, you know, uh, I'm like, take your best shot. But you cannot beat what I'm saying because I'm talking from facts. And then they go, in, well, who wrote that fact? The white man wrote it. Just like he wrote the Bible. I, oh, now, now you're going into, now you're going to religion on me. So it, it just goes, <laughs> it, it just rolls in. So now, uh, now my faith is, is, is being questioned because I'm a Christian. Uh, it doesn't make a difference what I am. I'm, I'm taking the, I've taken the vaccine. I'm vaccinated and I'm proud of it. And I'm standing on the position that I once was. So they take it to the Bible. I say, Paul was a killer. And he wrote a lot of the New Testament, Phile uh, uh, Corinthians, Philippians. And he wrote all of those books. But he was a man of God. But first, he was a killer of Christians. He he switched. Why can't I? Oh, Reverend Jenkins, it's working. <laughs> Can I get and a I, witness up in here? I, That's I, what stand, it's all I stand about. on my decision. The witness, that's what we are called I, I am. to do. Those I who am. have Use taken me, the vaccine yeah. to be a witness. Okay. And that's where the proof comes is, you know, that's the proof of the pudding. Uh, I heard something interesting the other day. Someone told me that before they took the vaccine, they had a pain in their arm. But once they took the vaccine, they ain't have it, had that pain before. Anybody else heard anything like that? I thought that was amazing. <laughs> so I guess the antibodies, you know, the immune system kicked in. I mean, I don't know, but these stories, that's what I'm saying. 
that's all people talk about is the vaccine about corona. And so it's the conversations, the relationships that matter. And our testimony, I know, like I said, even with the Johnson and Johnson, I tell them, you know, six people out of six million. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there has been a lot of issues about vaccines even before this, because people stopped getting their children vaccinated. You know, so it's about a distrust of vaccines, period. Yeah. You know, and that's what I've seen on um, Next Door, yeah. on some of the uh, social media things that people have problems with vaccines. And I agree with uh, Priscilla, because I, I, I have not taken the flu vaccine, okay? <laughs> because I knew too many people I didn't take it because everybody told me they got the worst cases of flu that they ever had in life. And I believed them. So I ain't take it. Okay. But I'm scur I was scurred into taking <laughs> the, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And you've yeah. been fine and haven't had the flu since, have you? No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had the flu I, since I'm still I here. taking the vaccine. Now, I'm not promoting don't get the vaccine, the flu vaccine. I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying here for me, I, it's been more than 10 years since I've taken that and I have not had a cold or, or the flu. And, and I can only say, and, it's, and I'm out there in the public front line, you know, main secretary for, you know, my division. And I'm just saying like, you know, I'm confused. Yeah. You know, I'm really confused. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing for for you, for me, for Mike, for Dr. Thomas, for the children. I want to do the right thing, but I'm so confused. And there is absolutely zero persons that's going to help me to understand for a person with my condition, was it the right thing for me to get this vaccination? And for the second shot, as terrified as I was getting the first shot, I'm equally, if not more terrified to get the second shot. For me, that's two days off from work. Mm. Not for so much for the vaccination or, or because I got the vaccination and what come, but for me, it's for, I just have to be still and settle myself down because I'm afraid. And so that's not going to go away. I believe Miss Michelle said from the very beginning how the fear and the lack of trust tracks us from the very beginning through the entire process. And, and that's where I am from the beginning to now. I am less than a week away from getting my second shot, a week and a day, and I'm terrified. I have a question for you. Okay. What, what, what what would ease some of your insecurities? What would ease some of that fear? If you knew what? Nothing's gonna ease it. Until you take it. Until, yeah, I, so I just, I, I have no choice. It, it, and, and you hate to say that because of all of the people that have taken it and, and the ones that don't want to take it, I have no choice. If I want to get back out in life that I've been sitting on for the last 15 months or more, if I want to get back out and be a part of that, then I have to get the vaccination. I, I have absolutely zero choice in the matter. So it's nothing anybody could say. I, Priscilla Green, I got to get out there and I got to take that step and get the vaccination, if not for myself, for the people around me. I have no choice, regardless of how I feel, regardless of my fears and insecurities, I have no choice. That's a That's very precarious place to be. I'm definitely gonna be praying for you to get some type of comfort in the decision that you've taken to be vaccinated. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Mike, I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so we've got about um, eight minutes in our small group before we have to go back to the big group. And one thing I'm curious about, it's been really interesting to hear you all talk about, um, you know, against some of the, the barriers in the community, particularly around trust and information, sort of the importance of community conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, so if we zoom way out and we think about joy and we think about a world after the COVID pandemic, if we were to imagine like Joy had type 2 diabetes and we were thinking about screening, what are some of the things that have emerged in the community from COVID that would actually be really helpful around talking to Joy about diabetes or helping her find care there? So, you know, immediately it sounds like at barbershops and faith communities, we're starting to actually talk about health more. What, what would you say are the things that have happened over the last year that you would want to carry forward um, to be helpful with with things like diabetes for joy. Well, I, you know, I as Priscilla said, I have an autoimmune disease, and that was one of my hesitancies about taking the vaccine because I said if I I take immunosuppressants to suppress my immune system, so I wondered if it was safe for me to take the vaccine when my immune system was being um, uh, suppressed anyway. But what helped me, I heard something from the, there's an autoimmune hepatitis um, uh, uh, foundation and they did a bunch of series to say that it was safe. I heard, saw that NIH said it's safe for people who are on MNLs suppressor. So mm -hmm. I think if the Diabetes Association, which and that would be a good one, because so many of us have diabetes, which I'm diabetic as well, but Corona has overshadowed that. Corona has overshadowed everything. But if I were to hear that it would, you know, and that's what my doctors told me, I would, I think you would do better taking the shot for the vaccine than to die from complications from the other disease. But um, I wanted to say something real quick too. Urban legends, uh, rumors, false information. What we have to do is to squash that because Katrina and Mike and uh, Priscilla probably know there's been a controversy about DMX because they say that his family still says that he died after taking, they said he didn't OD, that he died after, and he died two weeks after taking the, uh, virus, shot. the virus shot. Mm -hmm. And so when rumors like that go around, that builds up, just, you know, hey, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's so much so many rumors and false information um, going around that what we need to do is try to dispel some of those things. So Reverend, and, uh, yeah. you, you can never stop the, uh, the, the rumors that go on. Uh, I don't even have the facts on DMX. It's, it's so many things uh, from, from my level on, on the ground, which is the ground level from the, the street community level on up to the, the corporate level, uh, I've, you've heard so many different stories about DMX. Well, you know that he struggled with drug addiction throughout his whole career. Uh, he also, um, uh, they said that he signed his soul to the Illuminati and they cashed in. So that goes along with the conspiracy theory that you heard that the vaccine he took in two weeks later he kicked the bucket. I've been vaccinated three weeks now, and I'm I'm talking to you here live on the Zoom. I'm I'm here, <laughs> uh, so you know all those things can be challenged with just a conversation with factual basis behind it. Uh, the truth is, we don't know how DMX died. Only the doctors do. Only DMX know and God. But for the most part, they were saying he was uh, struggling with his drug addiction and. He died, um, unfortunately. So uh, we all have to pay the price. Is um, they can they can say anything. They could they could say that he jumped off a building and he died. He, he died, but the uh, 
to put it on the the vaccine, I think is a bit extreme. Uh, I've been vaccinated for three weeks now, going on a month. I'm still here, so it, I don't know what they were saying. DMX took it, and so two weeks later after the vaccine, you're going to die. I don't know what the message that you could get out of that. Uh, so, so Mike, I just like to keep everything on the front floor. That's all. So, so Mike, just imagine, because Sandra's saying, Dr. Quinn's saying, who's DMX? <laughs> Reverend, Jenkins, <laughs> Reverend Jenkins knows who DMX is. So it's yeah. down to that level where Reverend Jenkins is talking to us about the rumor <laughs> around DMX. That's telling you something, how far a rumor can fly. Yeah, no question. <laughs> I got children. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, go for it, Stephen. I was just going to say, now that we we're having these conversations in the barbershop, in the beauty salon, the underlying conditions earlier on, we said, well, how, why, why should I trust them now when I couldn't trust them when I had my fibromyalgia? I couldn't trust them when I had my type 2 diabetes. Why do they care now? Okay, now we're getting vaccinated. Now we're down this road. Can we use some of the same things we've learned to now address Joyce type 2 diabetes and all the other chronic diseases? What might we continue to do? Would we continue to have Zoom town halls? Reverend yes. Jim, we never had Zoom town halls before this coronavirus. <clears throat> Would we do more? I, I think... More of? I think that Dr. C, uh, uh, it should be a weekly town hall with people who has certain uh, secondhand illnesses like the type two diabetes. It should be someone on the call who has the type two diabetes, who's been vaccinated and sharing their experience. It should be somebody on, on the Zoom call who uh, had cancer and was going through chemo that had been vaccinated on the call for their expense. It should be any disparity, any secondhand ailments that we're talking about. It should be somebody who's taking that vaccine on the call to share their experience to help that person who has that secondhand ailment and giving them comfort who has already been vaccinated. I think that's great information, Mike. So, so, so that's more witnessing, Katrina. We yes, because I have, a, I have a client that has been asking me every time I'm on a Zoom, could you please find out about, she said she has an autoimmune disease as well. So if she was on this call, it would have brought her some type of comfort just listening to um, the lady saying that they had an autoimmune disease. It would have gave her a little more comfort in knowing, okay, well, they didn't have any side effects from the vaccination. And like she said, it's zero information out there for her about the autoimmune disease that she had in this vaccination. So she's very hesitant about taking a vaccination. And um, as a matter of fact, she just lost a cousin at 47 that has the same autoimmune disease that she has. So she want to get vaccinated, but she said, it's just no information out there for me. So like Mike said, if we can have more people that has these kind of ailments on the line, it would always help someone else. Okay. Who's been vaccinated. Yes, exactly. Even with the Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> yes, I'm going to tell my Even with Ms. Johnson and Johnson, even now. <laughs> I can't wait to call her when I get off of this call. You know what? I like you, Reverend Jenkins. I really do. <laughs> I'm so glad we could bring you together in Zoom. And that's one of the things that we might take forward that we have these Zoom calls around the chronic diseases, the underlying conditions, remember, that made mm -hmm. Corona so dangerous, but we still keep it in the context of COVID because the word is that we won't have to wait another 100 years before something like this happens again. So how do we keep these bridges, the infrastructure we've created with coronavirus mitigation in place for preparedness. I mean, we literally had on Monday, the hospital brought clinical people in and literally gave injections. They didn't just pass out literature and say, here's a referral. They did medical care in the barbershop. If they could do that, they could do other things. 
in the shop? How do we keep them uh, engaged? How might we keep them engaged? Um, that's such a very, uh, uh, it's, it's an easy question to answer, but it's also a difficult question to answer because like you have, you just, you no matter what we say or do, it's just so many nuances, I guess. I don't know if that's the correct word to use this, like, like a net. No matter what you do, they pick you apart and tear you apart and bring what you're trying to do. And I fully support it. I'm with it. I'm just like, how do you, you know, how do you do that? I don't want to, uh, I don't want to sound uh, like I'm trying to create segregation, but uh, identify, uh, identification with your race when it comes to the healthcare professional you're dealing with, I think will make a difference as well. Uh, I don't think that, I, I think uh, a black doctor will get a better result from a black person than a white, when a white person or a Spanish person. Boy, you, you brought us back right at the sweet spot, man. We were really going motion. Boom. <laughs> Help <Count> that. <laughs> Same in our group as well, um, Dr. T. Um, all right, so I know I know that we may have cut folks off, uh, you know, right in the middle of a, of a sentence. Uh, there was actually a very valid question from uh, from our group, and I'm hoping, Dr. T, uh, you can help answer for the group. So there's one question as to, you know, how is what we're doing today any different from, uh, you know, conversations of this nature we've had before? Um, and follow up question to that. Um, what is our relationship, you know, between Bridgeable, between Communivax, and between your with your group uh, at uh, UMD? Um, so I think that's a really good question. the The mere fact that Communivax has provided the resources for us to do this training uh, with a team out of Toronto, Canada, means that you're you're right now involved in what is the future of leadership development and training. And that's using these human-centered design methodologies, the storyboards, the, the, the post-its, the brainstorming. When you see the results of the, all the ideas that came out of our conversation, I think you're gonna be amazed, Edith. You're gonna be amazed at what sounded like just a conversation, everybody talking is actually a set of organized principles and these folks here are experts in drawing that out of us. They draw our wisdom out of our narrative. And um, the pre-work that we did to create the journey, I mean, we did all that work to in invest them into our community. And that was our jump off point. And so I'm hoping that we uh, learn these methodologies and build capacity for our other nonprofit organizations I'm going to say to Bridgeable, uh, you're, you're engaging people right now who, who have never had access to this. There are corporations that use these methodologies. They have resources. It never trickles down to our level. Now we have it. COVID forced us over the deep end. <laughs> Zoom existed before COVID, but I don't know how much time Priscilla spent on, on, on Zoom before all this happened. But here she is now in a whole workshop. <laughs> I know Reverend Jenkins didn't spend a whole lot of time on Zoom before this. I think that's going to be more of the future, and we're going to be able to bring ourselves together across so many barriers like transportation and parking that used to be all we would talk about when we bring the community to campus. I still think we need FaceTime. I don't think this takes the place of FaceTime, but it does organize our thoughts in ways that I'm always amazed at the output and the final product. So Mike would talk about uh, the use of pictures and, and whether or not people read or they see visual. We now know that these are learning styles. And for many people, a visual is a more appropriate learning style. So all of this, look at this. These are all icons. They can move around, they can change shapes. 
Um, and we think that for our community, this could fit very well. Uh, we come from oral traditions. And so just to talk it out, Reverend might have a term for that, just talk it out, you know, bear witness. And while they're bearing witness, Tim is doing the, doing the post-its for us. And all of a sudden we see our bearing witness taking shape in themes and ideas um, that we can then work with for intervention and, and actually creating an opportunity for joy to have a more healthy life. I, I hope I got that motion. Uh, that's excellent. Thank you so much. And that's a great segue um, because I noticed, again, you know, we want to be very, very, uh, you know, cognizant of the fact that we're not trying to solve this overnight. We have three hours. You know, we, we want to get that conversation going. We want you to weigh in on, on the things that worked, the things that didn't, and what can actually work for, you know, these other longstanding health issues. Um, so on that note, what I'd like us to do over these last few minutes is to just kind of do a quick summary of the conversations that happened in our groups. Um, we want to focus on, on the activity three, which is this future-focused journey uh, beyond COVID and how, if any, we could adopt, uh, you know, some, adapt some of these solutions uh, and the bridges from the COVID-19 vaccine journey over. So, um, Team Joy, do you have a volunteer or would one of you, do you, uh, uh, Dr. T, do you want to do the, the summary yourself? It's a super quick summary of what transpired. Uh, super quick. Uh, well, I'll do super quick and I'll get some help from my friends. If I were to, to use a word to describe what happened uh, with Joy in our group was that we had a, uh, we had a, um, we had a rough start. Uh, we had uncertainty. Uh, we had a little anxiety. And I think that was a good thing because it put us in her shoes. Whether we could navigate, find, you know, find the, where's the Zoom window? Where's this? Where's that? All of that is part of the unknown and the known and the unknown and the unfamiliarity. I think that's good we went through that because we, where we ended up, we were in a flow motion. We were in a flow and they were speaking honestly from the heart. So I would say that my word is honest. My second word is integrity. That's what came out of our group. Quickly, Priscilla, uh, give us a word, a thumbnail. Trust. Katrina? You're muted, Katrina. I say reassurance. Okay. All right. Beth? I was going to say reassurance as well. Okay, that means that word's just bigger. <laughs> uh, Mike, yeah. Mike what, what would your word be to characterize the journey with joy? We, we, we have to continue to step out on faith. Faith is my word. Okay. And now Reverend Jenkins? I say relationships. Mm -hmm. And the importance right. of relationships. Yeah. Now, now we had Mary Carnes. She's a, a grad student. She's been learning about this. She's a, like the fly on the wall watching. Okay, uh, Mary, what did you, what word characterizes what you saw? Well, I would reiterate trust because that came up a lot. Okay. <laughs> And Sandra? It's a journey. I think that that is really the notion. I love the road. I love the bus, uh, the bridges and the roadblocks. I think it's a metaphor that works. And that's the other thing that came out of our group. A lot of really grassroots metaphors and analogies, not medical metaphors and medical analogies, but real people grassroots people analogies. And I think that that works. And that came out of the conversation with how Mike and Katrina talked to people in the chair. I think we need more of that. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Motion. Thank you so much for that. I think we're gonna take the same framework that you've uh, put forth, uh, Dr. T. We're gonna ask uh, folks in Team Omar's group to also describe, provide a word that I think describes our uh, conversation. So I'm gonna start calling folks out and then just feel free to shout out uh, that. 
Harry, what's one word you might use? You're muted, Harry Williams. Oh, awareness. All right, awareness. All right. Uh, Maxine. Health. Health. Okay. And you can add, you can provide more words. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Don't take the one word as a, a oh. you know, too hard. So. Yeah, you can, you can put context on, put, put a heartbeat on. Okay, yeah. Really knowing what health is. I, I don't think that we grasp the concept of health. We always think of it as bodily when health is more than bodily. Okay. Um, Wesley. Oh, the word I would use is uh, thought provoking. All right, put some put a heartbeat on it, Wes. In other words, uh, once we of course had that initial uh, experience, then uh, uh, each individual who had a comment to make it was a very thoughtful comment and, and made a contribution to the whole discussion. Right, wonderful. Good to uh, see you, Wes. Yeah, Harry, how are you? Doing? <laughs> Uh, Edith, over to you. Sharing. Put a heartbeat on us, Edith. We were able to share our stories. Um, it was nice to put myself in someone else's shoes. Um, I have to do it all the time through constituent work because I work with all levels of people from young people to older people, whatever, but it's it was great to look through someone else's eyes. They call that empathy. I think that is so important and you captured it, Edith. Empathy. Fantastic. Um, all right, I, so we had a couple of other folks on our group as well. So I'm gonna call you both out. Meg, what's one word you would use? <laughs> um, holistic. I think um, thinking about problems as bigger than just a single point and thinking about a person as more than a single attribute was really important to our group. Mm -hmm. I need to make a statement, please. Can I make sure, a statement? Sure. <laughs> Can I make one statement? Uh, just get wait. Um, now I heard this somewhere and it might've been this past Sunday. Um, I can show a man where to fish and he will feed himself for a day. I can show a man how to fish and he will feel his vintage forever. So the education component for me is totally acute in reference to awareness. All right, so, so, so Harry, are you saying that this experience is teaching us how to fish in a, in a certain way? Absolutely. Okay. So Tim, we're awesome. going to feed the village with this knowledge. <laughs> right. Uh, we we have a few more to go, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. So, uh, Elsie, any a word that you would use, you would add? Um, I think mine is a, a couple of words. Um, I would say back to the basics. So listening to um, Mr. Williams, he said that if a person doesn't have a sense of self, and you're trying to get him to, for example, Omar to vaccinate, but he just, he's focused on surviving, then we need to meet the person where he is. And that's something that I, um, I think it's so important in terms of what we're doing and what we can take away or what I will take away from this experience. Awesome. Um, Kristen? Um, I would say bettering ourselves in health education wise, so looking out for health education, awareness, all that. Excellent. I think we've covered everything. Uh, unless, Monica, Emily, anything you'd like to add? Oh, yeah, we got to get the mothership in here. <laughs> uh, this is, oh. it's, it's a hyphenated word, uh -huh. uh, change demanding. What does that mean? Put a heartbeat on it, Monica. What does that mean? 
Yes. It, it means action. We need we need action. There's wisdom that needs to become action. Um, it needs to be allowed to become action. Um, anyway, that's what I mean. Thanks and for I'm, asking. I was thinking exactly along the lines of Monica, you know, this is something where there needs to be some some evolution of what's happening to to really be able to address the issue appropriately. Dr. T, I need to put a heartbeat on this this entire uh, presentation or activities this evening in reference to Central Prince George's County. Central Prince George's County, and regardless of the age group, even going down to middle school, high school, of all the markers of mobility, the 10 markers of mobility, Prince George's County is first in the state of Maryland. Of all of those numbers, being the highest. How can that be in what we call the so-called highest income population of, of Afro-Americans in the United States? Okay, I'm gonna keep it simple because it came up in our group, the issues around institutional racism, institutional inequality. And it plays out in our county, Harry, because in most groups, if we look at the data, as they get more income, more education, higher standard of living, they live longer. But when it comes to African-Americans in particular, even as they get more income, more education, they still live sicker and die younger. And the underlying theory is that the relentless pressure of living in a society that's racialized wears our organs and bodies down early. They call it weathering. And so well, that's Alice why this alone. moment, this moment we're in is so important because it is a reckoning around these issues of race and inequality. And we can use these tools that we've done here today to drill down and get at that and get to action. Yeah, but Prince George County is also the uh, one community in the state where it has the, um, it's cheaper to rent. You know, the low, the low rents are in Prince George's County as opposed to DC or Montgomery County. So we have an influx uh, of people because of, you know, one can get a reasonable rent in the county. But even that, that does not vouchers. address that does not address I'm, I'm, the unlawful. I'm not asking to address anything. I'm just saying here's no, I'm, I'm, no, my point. Oh, I was asking, I'm not saying I, it addresses anything. It's a, uh, no, a I'm, either, either, I agree with you. But I was asking Dr. T about a premise that the issue is that we'll there, there are two Prince George's counties, and we've already we talked about this. And there's one that is visible, and there's one that's not visible. So, and so what Harry, is visible is about 10% of the county. So Harry, 80 to 90% of, of the county is not visible. So, so Harry, you, you have set us up for the next bridge of it, the invisible communities. Because you know what, Edith? Montgomery County, that's perceived as highly wealthy, the home of the NIH, they got a real problem with poor people. Yes. yes. And yet they can't yes. overcome the fact that they're perceived as the most wealthy county in the high, entire state. They're trying to make the case that they need help. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's fascinating. Motion. All right. We On have that just note. begun. We have yeah. just begun. I just want, that's why that's why I use health, because racism, the social determinants of health. Implicit, but all of those things play a part in our inadequate health <laughs> as black folk. And so health is just not, I don't, I don't feel well. Uh, I don't want to take the vaccine. It's all of those things that bear on our decision making. And I'm through. I'm <laughs> well, let me say this because I see motion. You see how, how fast it went? Uh, see, they're ready to go now. They're all warmed up now. Absolutely, I was going yeah. to say this that it is the health is the solution space. 
We're talking about all these problems in housing, discrimination, and law enforcement. We'll I don't think we'll ever come together to solve and come to solutions there. But in health, we can do that. Priscilla, mm -hmm. who can be against making sure every baby lives beyond the first year of life? Who well, can? I'm Republican, who can, right? Correct. <laughs> so we're in the solution space. There's some that don't care. Well, you know, we'll bring them along by and by. Where's Reverend? Where's Reverend Jenkins? Reverend Jenkins, before motion, before motion, before you send us off, Reverend Jenkins, the one of the words was faith. We have stepped out on it. So give us something to have faith for. If you'll take a moment, Reverend Jenkins. I know you're not talking about praying. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, hey. You know, yes, the scripture that said, this kind comes not but with fasting and prayer. And pray. <laughs> hey. But anyway, I just thank God for this. You know, I've seen so many good things about the pandemic. When it started, God said, I'm going to do a new thing. All of us are together in this. We would have not probably met like this had it not, you know, it says that all things work together for good. Hallelujah. There's some good things and bad things. But I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet some of you that I would have never talked to, never been exposed to. But we have to have faith in that this will not last always, that there is a solution and that we will, through the help of God, find a solution and that all things are possible when you have faith, hallelujah. All things are possible. It also said there's nothing too hard for God. God can stop everything. And when we, it is power, um, oh, and I'm gonna stop, cause you know, see, I like to preach. But anyway, Kathy Hughes used to always say on WOL, information is power. And we got a powerful group on here. And I believe you've been chosen for such a time as this, that each one of us has been chosen for who we are. For who we are, Brother Mike, we've been chosen to be messengers, to be a witness of what can happen. So and I'm not going to talk anymore, but I'm going to just say, may the blessings of God, the peace of God be with you always. And also know with that you. you have been chosen for such a time as this. Amen. Hey, for Amen. such a time Amen. as this. Amen. Amen. Oh, Amen. COVID. Michelle, pandemic. Tim, that's how we roll here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, Dr. T, I mean, rough the health. I, I do a lot of biking. I've been biking for some time. I have never seen the number of black people out walking, biking, jogging out there with the families out there with the kids in the parks i have never seen this in my since i've been yes in yeah. this area and if there's one thing that's happened from the pandemic yeah it has caused us to reflect on ourselves that's right take charge of your own health motion you better send us out here when we start the evening be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> i do um, so before I pass over to Tim to, to close things up for us, we have posted a link to a feedback survey. Um, please, please do make it a point to fill it in. Just click on the link, uh, have it open in your browser and you can do it later, but just click on it and have it open so that you can fill it up later. Um, as we mentioned at the start, this is a pilot workshop. So any feedback that you provide will go into making this better as we roll out uh, the same workshop to other communities. And with that, what do you think? Yeah, for sure. Um, so thanks so much for spending three hours with us. We know it's a bit of a lift on a weeknight. We, we really appreciate it. We generated a ton of digital post-it notes. And so we're gonna work with Dr. Thomas and his team to synthesize them and look at what the themes were and, and particularly looking at what are the gains that we've made in health equity um, and, and how do we wanna continue those? So um, again, really appreciate your time. I'm really looking forward to 
um, getting back with the research team and sort of carrying forward the learnings. Um, it's, it's super helpful. And uh, it was so nice to meet everyone and, and have a chance to connect. So thanks again for taking time and uh, uh, all the best. Bye. I'm going to have bye bye. Dr. T do your uh, mandatory closing. Yeah. Uh, I used to say, tomorrow. wear your mask. And in fact, I'm, I'm, Reverend Jenkins, you're absolutely right. I don't care what the CDC says. I'm wearing my mask. I'm washing my Wearing the mask. And washing the hands. Self social distancing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Right. Have a great okay. night. Time for wine. Time for Chardonnay. <laughs> Do that. Go we'll have the Chardonnay. Mask. Uh, Wear your mask. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.